So as some of you may remember, in 2018, Crunchyroll released a trailer for a show called High Guardian Spice. It was received with so much backlash that the comments were almost immediately removed and the show was delayed from its original release date in 2019 to being released quietly onto the platform back in, on the sick to being released quietly onto the platform back on the 26th of October. The trailer in question was not good. This being mostly because it was less of a trailer detailing the plot and more of a long promo explaining how the show was special and diverse because the writing team was made up of entirely white women. Of course, as is common on the internet, Reddit weebs and Crunchyroll regulars took this declaration to heart making triggered jokes that stopped being relevant in 2016 and probably were never funny and mocking the weight, appearance, or gender of people simply because they didn't agree with what they were seeing. This backlash negatively affected the show to the point where the cast and crew disbanded the and the show, finished and originally planned to be released in 2019, stood in streaming service Limbo for two years before Crunchy Rose decided, eh, screw it, and plopped it out onto their platform just to see what happens. So what happened? A lot of negative reviews, many from people who have just watched clips on YouTube and never even watched the show. But this also means it's likely not going to get a second season. And I think that sucks. Why? Because I watched all 12 episodes of High Guardian Spice. And I didn't hate it. Was it good? Uh, no. But it wasn't the soul-sucking horrid train wreck I wasn't expecting either. It was a charming yet poorly written show, crammed with potential and damned from the start by poor marketing and waves of people judging something without giving it a proper chance. So that's what we're going to be doing today, giving High Guardian Spice a proper chance. All right, so what is this show about besides girl power triggered snowflakes or whatever co people called it back in 2018? It's about Rosemary, a young girl who's training to become a guardian and her best friend Sage who leave home to attend a boarding school where they can follow their dreams. They then meet a dwarf named Parsley and an elf named Ty, which I know what you're thinking, and yes, that is where the name of the show comes from. The show isn't exactly... Subtle. So, what is a guardian? Good question. I have no idea. I mean, aside from the obvious, a guardian meaning a protector who keeps someone or something safe, the show doesn't go out of its way to explain what a guardian exactly is. That's my biggest critique with the show, I think. The story just sort of happens to the characters instead of the other way around. And I never really get an explanation on what exactly the story is. It's just a dumb, generic fantasy boarding school plot that never goes beyond that. So this world is pure fantasy with elves, dwarves, magic, demons, cat people, and dragons. There's old magic, which requires some kind of cost, and new magic, which is more efficient and doesn't appear to require any kind of cost. I I've seen comparisons of this to Little Witch Academia's magic system, but at least the latter goes in depth with its explanations of what the two types of magic are. They never explain new magic versus old magic, just that new magic is apparently better. There's also some bad corrupt magic called the rot or something, but we never really get an explanation on that either. I think this is because the show was supposed to focus on the characters rather than getting muddled in the plot or world building, but like, offer us something? Because the world of this story comes off as generic and just a ripoff of every single fantasy world, especially those with all-female casts. It's like the creators of the show watched... Uh, Sailor Moon and uh, My Little Pony and Little Witch Academia and maybe some Harry Potter and they just kind of cobbled those things all together and thought, okay, yeah, I mean everybody knows what an elf is but 
without they, but they did this without giving anything new to elves or dwarves or any of the races that they introduce. So we're left just sort of speculating at what the world is or what's going on within it, which is not a place you want your audience to be. Especially when you have a visual medium like animation, it's so easy to convey little details about the world, but the show just never does that. They have these spheres that they use with new magic, but they never really explain how they work. And I think it'd be so interesting to actually go into that. Uh, like I said, the show has so much potential, and yet it doesn't go anywhere with that. And to be fair, this is just a first season. If this show somehow managed to get a second season, which it definitely won't be, I think it would go more... I would. I think it would have the chance to do more with this plot, because, I mean, a lot of animated series don't uh it's, don't do a lot with their first season as far as world building goes but there's so many examples of of shows where the first episode establishes so much world just by subtle hints either in the background or in dialogue, then in the narrative, um, even just like within the visuals of the show, it just show it, it begins to tell you like, um, what the world is all about and how it works. But the problem with High Guardian Spice is it never really gets to that point where it tells you what the, it's just a generic fantasy world there's mermaids there's dragons i guess but we don't know what anything is or what it means or what the hierarchy for anything is like give us something i'm begging you The worst. All right, video over. Just kidding, okay. Rosemary is the protagonist, and she has dead, not dead mom syndrome. We find out quickly that her mom disappeared four years ago, and we're supposed to care because she cares. She wants to go to the school for guardians, but we never see any passion or drive from her. I, in fact, the only reason she wants to become a guardian is because of her dead, sorry, missing mother, who was a famous guardian. We also don't have any repercussions of her being the daughter of a famous person who literally went to the same school as her. There's just the occasional, oh, that's your mom? She was super famous. And then the scene continues. She's also deeply annoying, more so than your average anime protagonist. Like, at least Usagi has charm. She's incredibly impulsive, and while most protagonists who are this way learn to think through their decisions after their impulsivity leads to either them or someone else getting hurt. Rose just never gets this. She always wins in the end, and the worst thing that happens to her is getting her worst memories exposed to the whole school before she can expose her best friend's worst memories to the school. She also gets injured and almost bleeds out and doesn't tell anyone. Later they tell us Rose is terrible at keeping secrets, so why does she do this? The show gives us zero explanation or character motivation for not telling her friends she's hurt. She literally almost dies for no reason because she's stupid. She also, in the first episode, swings around a sword in a public marketplace and gets mad at the person she almost hits with it. Some self-awareness would do this girl wonders. So anyway, all this to say, Rose is extremely annoying and honestly one of the worst parts of the show. Rosemary's best friend and a mage. Sage grew up learning old magic, whatever that is, from her mother, and now coming to school, she discovers that her old way of doing things might not cut it. She's insisted that her previous way of doing things, her old magic, is better because it requires more hard work. 
new magic just feels like cheating to her, and even when she tries it, it doesn't come naturally to her, and she feels like she's compromising her values, or at least her mother's values. Again, this would be a lot more compelling if we had any idea what the magic system was all about. Even in a story mainly focused on the characters, you cannot neglect world building, or this is what happens. The other characters label her as boring and stuck in her ways because she wants to do things the old-fashioned way, and so she starts to hate being at school, especially when she realizes how terrible a person her best friend is. Most of her character conflict is deciding what she should do with her powers, and it has the potential to be compelling character concepts. Unfortunately, this is High Guardian Spice. She's also deeply in the closet. Like, she definitely has a crush on Rose, and for whatever reason is in denial about it. Like, seriously, look at how the blue girl and the pink girl look at each other. They just won't kiss. Ugh. The ranger of the party. Time is an elf from a far off forest who is sick of being stuck in the city. She wants so badly to be Raven from Teen Titans, but she's more like Raven from Teen Titans Go. That is to say, she doesn't have much of a personality. She's grumpy and standoffish because she was forced from her home after the rot to get over, and she's resentful of her mother who made her leave behind her father. She, like Sage, does have an interesting bit of character. That being her father, a mage who does earth magic, try to teach her what he knew, but time never had any time. <laughs> Get it? Okay. For magic, she liked to be moving, active. She wanted to be a warrior, and as a result, she knows very little magic. She regrets this because now she's miles and miles away from her home and her father, and now she fears she'll never get the chance to learn from him again. But like Sage, this is never greatly expanded upon. In fact, I assumed, like, half of what I just said about time situation and invented character emotions and ideas that may or may not exist in the actual narrative. But that's how this show works. It introduces great concepts and then just throws them out the window and leaves you, the audience member, to scrounge around for the pieces. One compliment I will give her is that her dialogue is the most human-sounding of the whole main four. And that's about all I have to say about her. A dwarf with a big hammer who loves blacksmithing and has a lot of siblings. Great. Original. Parsley does come off as pretty charming, though, and she's probably my favorite of the main cast of four. She's tough, she's ambitious, and she always looks on the bright side of a situation. She grew up in a house with a lot of younger siblings, and she never really got a childhood because she had to look after them all the time. One of the more enjoyable episodes actually revolves around her being home for the weekend and her parents trying to convince her to come back home and help take care of her numerous brothers. The episode ends with them having to learn not to rely on their child to parent their children for them and actually do their jobs. They do a thing that parents never do in real life and they apologize to Parsley for putting so much pressure on her. She's not selfish like someone else, <coughs> Rosemary. And she's always there for people who she cares about. She doesn't have some edgy backstory, which I am grateful for, but she's always there to help others through their baggage. She's a fun and simple character who isn't trying to be anything special. She's a basic, enjoyable, generic fantasy character, and she doesn't need to be anything more. She's just Parsley. Okay, Snapdragon is by far my favorite character, next to Slime Boy, of course. I think the writers confirmed Snapdragon being transgender somewhere, but for the time being, I'll refer to them by neutral pronouns. So Snapdragon is the sidekick of the bully character, which, okay, I will make the point that the bully characters, as well as the villains, are the best characters in the show by far. But Snap is friends with Amaryllis, who bullies Sage for being basic. They're not, uh, they're not really into the whole mean girls thing, and would kind of just rather make Snyder marks and be depressed in the background, which same. They seem to have a crush on Sage. Aim higher, queen, please. You're way out of her league. And end up becoming friends with her after the episode where all the teachers throw the kids in a labyrinth. Oh yeah, did I mention this place is like Hogwarts, but worse? Seriously, I think they want these kids to die. 
Sage is actually super sexist to Snapdragon in that episode, saying that guy friendships and girl friendships are different, and guys don't express their emotions, so you can't understand how I'm feeling, which is literally how toxic messages about masculinity are spread to men in the first place. Snap's gender in this context doesn't matter, it was still a stupid thing to say, and sort of marked the turning point for me in starting to dislike Sage as a character, but I digress. Snapdragon dresses up as a mermaid for the Halloween two-parter to match Axe Girl's pirate costume, and wow, they are the only two good characters in the show, aren't they? And gets harassed by some dude we heard mentioned once and only met this episode, and only exists to be an asshole. A few episodes later, Snapdragon beats up the dude for being a jerk again and gets taken off the mission they were on with the main four. Oh, come on, I wanted to see them be a hot mermaid again. After this, they have an awkwardly written but heartwarming scene with the canonically trans professor who asks why they were so upset with what the bully said, and they respond with, I think it might be true, I might want to be a girl. And this moment solidifies in my mind what the show wanted to be. It wanted to be the next Steven Universe or She-Ra for animation, something that minorities could look at and say, that's me. And while it isn't a great show, moments like these... I think are where it holds the most potential for improvement. Snapdragon then talks with Amaryllis, who says that she'll be their friend no matter what, and in the finale, they're seen with pain and nails, a sign that despite what others think, they're slowly coming into their own and becoming their true self. All this to say, I'm going to be writing a series of comments over on my Tumblr. Link will be in the description below, where Snapdragon is the main character, because to me, they're the most compelling character, and I want to see a world where... Both the writing and world building is clear, and Snapdragon gets the spotlight they so rightly deserve. Best girl, best girl, best girl! That's all. Amaryllis, or Axe Girl as I dubbed her in all my notes, is a stereotypical mean girl. But being mean is just her surface layer. Deep down, she actually does care a lot, especially about her best friends. Her meanness, and we're going to assume again here because the show doesn't give us much, comes from a need to be noticed. Negative tension from someone you fling harsh words at is still attention, and that's something her parents never gave her. They were too busy with their work and their affairs to ever notice her, and so she projects that loneliness onto other people. I mean, at one point she bullies Sage for only having one friend, which she literally also has one friend. Self-awareness is an important virtue, Amaryllis. She's inseparable for two episodes before becoming the best character. And I mean, to be fair, I want to bully Rosemary too. She's terrible. And everyone loves a crazy girl with an axe. She's loud, she's mean, she's crazy loyal, and she's a solid character who serves as one of the best parts of the show. Okay, and here's the part where we go through the other characters really quickly. Slime Boy, awkward little nasty boy who is my favorite and also everyone else's favorite. He's characterized by his mumbled dialogues that's reminiscent of Kaichiro from the Ghost Stories dub and also Jason Funderbreaker from Over the Garden Wall. He's best boy, best slime, slime boy. Caraway, the creator's literal self-insert. There's a scene where he explains what transgender means in a force-fed way that makes the show seem like it's made for nine-year-olds despite being rated mature. Also, he's got something going on with Sage's aunts or cousins who are also creator self-inserts. I hate them all so terribly. Olive, the cat girl who serves as the villain for a few episodes before... Well, I won't spoil that, but I do want her to step on me. Cal, little trash bag that bullies Snapdragon. I want to take him and rewrite him and make him a better man. He doesn't deserve it, but it's what I want for him. It's not good. We already knew this. It's probably the first thing you heard about the show. It's it's awkward, stilted, and sounds more like it was written by someone who spends their time reading Tumblr posts and someone who actually interacts with human beings in real life. With iconic lines like, I'm always glad to talk. Oh, it's it's all in the wrist of your brain. I have to demonstrate it a lot at the store. Here, here, hold on. I'll draw you a diagram. And conversations like, Oh, boring. How do you guys and Professor Bunny know each other? Oh, we, uh... We go to the same parties. 
what's not to love? But seriously, the writing in this show sucks. <laughs> the main problem with this and with the voice acting is that they gave this project to entirely new people with no or very little experience. Which, on one hand, is fine because that's how people get experience. But when it's the whole cast and crew, yikes. Granted, there are a few people with some prior writing experience, like writer Amalia Lavari, who I believe actually won an Emmy for her work on Over the Garden Wall, which, if you haven't seen, is an amazing show. I believe these people do contribute to the bits of charm the show contains, although these bits of charm are often overlooked by the uncomfortable dialogue and awkward pacing. Seriously, the show moves so incredibly fast that it's difficult for me to keep up at times. And I have ADHD. And another thing, the show is really mature, but it's painfully obvious this was added later, as well as the content warning at the beginning of every episode. This could so easily be a kid's show that it's jarring when you switch magical best friend fantasy quest to Amaryllis calling someone a bastard. Which, honestly, she deserves. You go, Axe Girl. This show is confused about what it wants to be. Is it for adults? Is it for kids? It's so on the nose with its theming and messages that it comes off as a made-for-child audience, but then there's swearing, too. And I guess blood as well, but I think Gravity Falls had more blood, and that was rated TVY7. This is probably one of the main problems with the show. It, it doesn't know its audience. The writing is confusing, it's weird, and it reminds me of the Percy Jackson and How to Train Your Dragon fanfics I wrote when I was 12. Not bad, per se, but definitely written by someone with zero friends. Okay, it isn't the best, but it also isn't the worst. There's compilations of animation errors online, but I honestly blame the production and editing teams for this more than the animators. Animation is hard work, and honestly, the stuff we get isn't that bad. The art itself is fine. Like, the show, it's generic and it's nothing special, but it's not terrible. Dare I say I even like a lot of the character designs. As much as I hate Rosemary, I'll admit that she's got a cute look. She almost looks like a person I'd want to be around. Amaryllis' design is perfect, and same with Slime Boy, my beloved. As much as I find the creator's self-insert, who he voices, by the way, annoying, I'll admit that his design is fun. And Snapdragon is so cute, I could draw them for years. And I will. <coughs> and also... A lot of the fight scenes are kind of awkward and stilted, but there's a couple of gems hidden in there that are actually well animated and interesting to watch. So, is High Guardian Spice the worst animated series to ever exist? No, obviously. At least, to me, this isn't Mr. Pickle, Teen Titans Go, Neo Yokio, XR, or whatever other horrible animated train wreck you can think of. If you can look under the surface of bad writing and bad marketing, High Guardian Space isn't a cash grab. It's trying to be something. It wants to be a fantasy series for those who never got a fantasy series. I mean, Harry Potter was written by a turf, and it took till 2016 for Rick Riordan to make a trans character. And by then, most kids had moved on past their demigod-obsessed preteen years. So, does it succeed in doing this? Uh, no, not exactly. I mean, the world of High Guardian Spice isn't exactly comparable to Tolkien, and the High Guardian Academy is no Hogwarts, although it seems like it's just as dangerous. <laughs> in fact, many minority kids found more solace in series like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings simply because the worlds and characters were so well-written and intricate they could almost escape into them. I know I did. So no, High Guardian and Spice isn't a revolutionary tale that pushes forward diversity in the animation industry, but it doesn't have to be, and luckily we're seeing this be done slowly through other shows. And it isn't a horrible, terrible mess like many on online reviews claim. I went in expecting torture, but instead I got an experience comparable to other shows with jarringly mixed reviews, like Evangelion or the first season of Steven Universe. So, while well, High Guardian Spice isn't a show to beat all shows, I do hope that it becomes a cult classic in its own way, awkward writing and all.